Why do more than half of British people now feel they can no longer say what they really think? Why do more than 60% say the experts in this country no longer understand the lives of people like us? And why do nearly two thirds say the old parties, the old politicians, no longer care about people like them? The answer is the institutions. The institutions which claim to represent us, which claim to speak for us, which claim to work on our behalf, are no longer interested in us at all. In Westminster, our political institutions have been hijacked by people who have the same backgrounds, who often went to the same schools, the same universities, who hold the same values, and who, whether on the left or the right, now lean much further to the cultural left than the average person. And this is especially the case for the Labour Party, the one movement which used to ensure that ordinary people had a voice in the conversation. But today, Labour MPs are more likely than Conservative MPs to belong to the same graduate class. And they've often spent their entire lives in politics and are increasingly adrift from the cultural concerns of a much larger number of people. But it's not only about politics. The civil service, the cultural institutions, the creative industries, print and broadcast media, the universities, the public bodies, they're all dominated by the same people who come from the same backgrounds and hold the same values and who are now using those institutions to impose their values, their worldview on the rest of us. Who are they? They're financially secure, if not affluent. They live in the big cities, the university towns. They're the members of the elite graduate class who went to Oxbridge or Russell Group universities, who tend to marry other members of that class and who often have parents who come from the same class. And they're consistently the most politically intolerant of all. They're the most likely to distance themselves, to look down on people who hold different values and different views from their own. And while this new elite is utterly obsessed with preaching about racial, sexual and gender diversity, when it comes to the institutions they dominate, they're actually not that diverse at all. They all subscribe to the same stifling consensus, and they're now drifting away from the rest of us on a whole range of issues. Increasingly, they're not just embracing social and economic liberalism, but importing a divisive, woke ideology from abroad, which contends that all Western nations like Britain are institutionally racist, and so their history, culture, and identity should not just be revised, but repudiated while the wider British majority should be treated with suspicion, if not contempt. For the new elite, these luxury beliefs have become a crucial marker of their social status and their sense of moral righteousness, something they use to both win approval from other elites while simultaneously distinguishing themselves from the rest of us, who they see as a morally inferior underclass of racists and ignorant idiots who voted for Brexit and wanted to do something different. This is why they've become much more supportive than everybody else of what I call the revolution. Mass immigration, hyper-globalization, much weaker national borders, and obsession with diversity, of putting minority interests above the majority. Net zero, sending power away from the people to unelected bureaucrats and supranational institutions, and exposing our children no, indoctrinating our children into gender ideology and critical race theory, neither of which have much of a basis in science. And in turn, they've become much more opposed to what a much larger number of people do care about and what they do want. They want to live in a self-governing, independent nation. They want to have full control of their borders and their laws. They want to have independent and impartial public institutions which serve the interests of the majority, not the elite minority. They want to live in a society with strong families where our traditions, our culture, our way of life are respected, not repudiated. And where boundaries and borders are upheld and while there is some immigration and cultural change, it's dramatically slowed down so that our community our inheritance, can be preserved and passed on to the next generation. But the new elite don't think like this. And as they've been moving sharply leftwards on these cultural issues, 
they've been taking the institutions with them. The BBC, the museums, the galleries, the National Trust, the large corporations, the universities, the marketing companies, all of which are now routinely imposing this liberal progressive, if not woke ideology on the rest of us, no longer interested at all in representing the majority. You see this in how civil servants now routinely leak against government ministers who happen to be pursuing policies which challenge this stifling orthodoxy. You see it too when some civil servants even threaten to strike when they're faced with policies that have been brought forward by a democratically elected government but which they don't like, such as the government's Rwanda plan for dealing with illegal migration. A policy, by the way, more people support than oppose. You see it when large government departments, such as work and pensions, are forced to pay out £100,000 to a renegade civil servant who blew the whistle on how our government departments are now training their staff in this radical, woke ideology. You see it in how institutions like the BBC have been reprimanded for failing to show sufficient interest in the lives of ordinary working people who do not belong to this elite. And you see it in how whistleblowers have told us how organisations like the BBC have become used to portraying everybody else in profoundly negative ways. I think you also see it in how prominent journalists who once claimed to be impartial and committed to truth then leave media, start their own podcasts and suddenly transform into the liberal progressive activists we suspected they were all along, while lecturing the rest of us on so-called misinformation. You see it in how the government is now spending at least £7 billion a year on woke projects, often funding the very charities and quangos they claim to oppose and which are undermining the national community. Like the Arts Council, which ran a programme on unlearning whiteness. Or in how the apparently cash-starved National Health Service is now spending at least £8 million a year on diversity, inclusion, woke jobs. And you see it too in how our public institutions, our schools, our universities, the NHS, increasingly resemble political training camps where citizens are bombarded with rainbow flags, lanyards, political posters and hashtags, signalling their allegiance to social liberalism, if not radical woke ideology. In fact, so strong is the groupthink in our institutions that many of the people who work in them don't even consider these things to be political at all, like believing there are hundreds of genders, or believing in dodgy concepts like white privilege, or separating people on the basis of their race. But these are deeply political. There's no difference between demonstrating solidarity with Black Lives Matter and demonstrating solidarity with Donald Trump. There's no difference between asking people to wear political insignia to show their commitment to radical gender ideology than asking them to wear a Make America Great Again baseball cap. Both of these things are highly political acts which should have no place in our taxpayer-funded public institutions. None of this is a conspiracy. The long march through the institutions, maybe it happened, maybe it didn't. I think what we're simply living through is the effects of what researchers call education polarisation, which refers to the way in which our elite graduate class are basically drifting away from everybody else. And they're reshaping the institutions around their values because those institutions are only full of people like them. This is why you're probably spending much of your time now watching and listening to the news, the adverts on television, the latest revision of our history on Netflix, the latest celebrity or journalist proclaiming that everything from cricket to the English countryside is racist and feel like a stranger in your own country. It's why when the British were recently asked to estimate the share of the population that is black, gay, lesbian, trans or vegan, they massively overestimated the numbers. It's because we're all now being exposed daily through the institutions to a political and cultural revolution which is warping our sense of who we are. It's also why many of you are probably looking at Britain today with a palpable sense that people like you are not really in this conversation at all. And you're right to feel this way because, to be blunt, you're not. If you come from the working class, if you didn't go to university, if you went to a less prestigious university if you hold culturally conservative values, then your chance of making it in the most important and influential institutions in our society is next to zero. 
Some of these institutions, like the universities where I work, are now even trying to ensure that people who do hold different values are kept out of them altogether. They make people who apply for jobs or research grants submit things called diversity statements, forcing them to swear their allegiance to this new ideology, while those who do dare to speak out, who do challenge the orthodoxy, are openly discriminated against. It's just one example of how the new elite are actively using our institutions to silence and stigmatise dissenting voices, framing anybody who challenges or merely questions this revolution as an assortment of racists, gammons, chavs and little Englanders. Most Brits don't want to live in a society like this. Most Brits want the first word in representative democracy to actually mean something. Most Brits want to look out at the civil service, at Westminster, at the cultural institutions, at the television programmes, at the adverts, at the media class, at the national conversation, and see and hear people who look like them, who share their worldview, and not feel as though they're now being forced to look in on Britain, their home, from the outside. So what can be done? As I explained in my first video, what I'm doing is building a community of people who not only share my concerns, but are seriously interested in addressing them. And how might we do that? Well, firstly, I think we need to build an alternative ecosystem. We need to build a thriving and successful alternative to the old institutions which we can use to impose ourselves on the national conversation, which is no longer listening to or even respecting people like us. For the first time in history, we have a rich and growing community of YouTubers, substackers, news channels, online magazines, which are truly independent of the institutions. We need to support and share that ecosystem. The new elite might laugh, but there's a reason Radio 4 Today has lost 2 million listeners since Brexit. There's a reason the old media is collapsing. There's a reason why many of these institutions are just a bad financial year away from going bust. Why trust in them is collapsing and why new platforms like this one are taking off. People have had enough. Secondly, I think we need to reform the institutions. So they include a much wider and diverse range of voices and values within them. They need to be forced to spend less time obsessing about race, sex and gender and more time making room for voices from outside of London, from the working class, from the non-graduate majority, from people who hold alternative beliefs and viewpoints to the elite class. Thirdly, we need to introduce new laws, like the one that I help fight for and secure in Britain's universities, to ensure that people who do challenge the orthodoxy, who hold gender-critical, pro-Brexit or culturally conservative views, cannot be discriminated against because of those views. And we need to support organisations who are actually winning in this culture war, like the Free Speech Union. This will encourage more people who are currently terrified to speak out to come forward and join with us. Fourthly, we need to stop and remove all openly political activist groups from becoming embedded within our institutions. There should be no place in our schools, our universities, our public bodies for activist campaigners that are promoting radical, contentious and highly political ideas like gender ideology, critical race theory and wokeism. Talking to the likes of Stonewall, who present a one-sided view of the gender debate, is fine. Having them embedded within the institutions, training staff and ranking those organisations is not. No political campaign groups on the right, the left or the centre should have privileged status within the institutions. They present a distorted view of the world. They're politicising our organisations, our public square, our children and are turning people against one another, prioritising minority rights over the rights of the wider majority. These are only a few things we could be doing right now. So if you're interested in working with me to see how far we could go, then join us and begin by sharing this video. Thank you.